thieves, robbers, murderers, insurrectionists, runaway slaves, all sorts of folks found their end at the hand, at the hand of the Roman Empire on this little rock on the outskirts of Jerusalem. But of all of those who died there, only one of them changes our lives today. The one who was crucified there that was guilty of nothing is the one that has affected all kinds of people today. Max Lucado, in his book, In the Grip of Grace, tells the story of uh, being cut off from his insurance company because of one too many tickets and accidents. Can you imagine that, getting this uh, letter in the mail saying that, uh, sorry, your driving record speaks for itself. We can no longer insure you. You cause a problem for our company. You are too big of a risk for the other insurers. And I'm looking around the room just to make sure that I don't see any guilty smiles that somebody here can identify with. I'm not seeing anybody. That's good. Maybe nobody here has been cut off from too many accidents. Imagine that happened to you and you phone up the insurance company and say, hey, how about a little mercy here? How about you, you just show me a little bit of mercy? Don't cut me off. I promise I'm going to be a better driver. Would it be true mercy if you did that? Really, it would put the company at risk for their reputation. It would put the rest of those who they insure at risk for higher premiums. It would not be true mercy just to ignore your poor driving record. Well, Cato goes on to say, then imagine you get this letter. We have found a way to deal with your mistakes. I cannot overlook them, for to do so would be unjust. I cannot pretend to ignore your driving record. To do so would be a lie. But here's what I can do. In our records, we have found a person with a spotless past, never broken the law, not one violation, not one trespass, not even a parking ticket. He has volunteered to trade places with you. We will put your name on his record, and we will take his name and put it on yours. We will punish him for what you did. You did wrong will be made right. And he who did right will be made wrong. Your response might be indeed, you're kidding. You might even phone up the insurance company and say, really, who is it who would be willing to trade their driving records? And the only answer you could possibly get would be to be the president of the insurance company. That is the cross, really, in a nutshell, isn't it? That the one who is in charge and deserves nothing takes the rap for everything that we did that is wrong. Salvation comes completely from God. It begins and ends with Jesus. We have no control over it other than to accept it. Psalms 23 is a familiar refrain in the sixth verse. Surely goodness, and, and get, next word gets translated a few different ways, but surely goodness and merciful love, an overwhelming merciful love, surely goodness and mercy will follow us in the English all the days of our life, but that's not what it says in the Hebrew. It says love, this loving mercy, this goodness, they're going to chase us. And in the context of it, it's, a, it's a, written about shepherds, right? I've said this in church well, a number of years ago now, but it's a shepherd's song, right? And in the context there, it's the idea that goodness and love are like the sheepdogs that chase after the wayward sheep. They pursue them. 
They pursue the sheep and try to bring them back into the fold, bring it back to a place of safety. And the sheep may not always appreciate the sheepdog. The sheep may not even like the sheepdog. At times, the sheep may not be happy in any way with the sheepdog, but that doesn't mean the sheepdog are going to back off. That's how love and mercy from God are. They chase us down. Even when we're not looking for them. The sheep may not understand even what the sheepdog is doing. Sometimes they may even hate the sheepdog. But they keep coming. I'm going to promise you the love of God, the mercy of God, the goodness of God, that's what the cross is all about. Pilate condemns Jesus. He hands him over for torture and execution. The soldiers mock him. They respond to his love and to his kingship with, and his power with mockery. And two weeks ago, last time we were in Mark, we said that they're either, they either accept him as king or we hold him in mockery. What does accept? There's a gentleman by the name of Simon who describes the father of Rufus and Alexander. He's from a city called Cyrene in modern day Libya. Clearly, by the way, the Mark and the other gospel writers discuss him. He is clearly, and his sons clearly, are known to the early church. They knew who he was. Jesus being paraded. As a broken man through the streets of Jerusalem, he collapses, they grab Simon, and he sees through this broken man to see a king who's willing to do for him, everything for him. We're coming to a really hard sermon the next couple of times we're at Mark. Today and the next few. It's hard to be a lot of jokes and things like that. It's one of those moments where we just need to be a little somber. To know this story that we know so well in a fresh light. We're going to look at three different individuals and groups who speak to us despite a familiar story. This is the most serious story ever told in history, and yet, in a very odd way, it is also the most joyous. Very sad, and yet should leave us with great joy and hope. The first few verses, we find this true king, who some mock, who some follow. We're not going to walk through the horrors of the death of the resurrection, but we see Jesus brought to the place of the skull. A place on the outskirts of Jerusalem that we think is this spot. I'm not absolutely positive. Um, if I was to show the full picture, and I found several examples of this, what you would mostly see surrounding this hill today seem to be tour buses. We'll figure. I cut that out of the picture. People flock there to see this place where we think Jesus died. Jesus comes to this place. And they bring him to the top of the hill. And they offer him a drink to dull the senses. A drink to kind of take away some of the pain, to, to calm him. I mean, it's much easier to execute somebody when they're calm. He refuses the drink because he wants to fully accept the bitterness of the rejection of the moment. There is no way that he could dull it down. They nailed him up on the cross in the worst way that the Romans could come up with to execute somebody. And he won't go through it unless he knows the full horrors of what humanity is putting him through. But it will crush his soul. 
Humanity throws its worst at Jesus. And he accepts a rejection. He voluntarily takes a rejection. What does rejection do to you? When somebody treats you poorly, when somebody is cruel to you, do you do something nice in return? Most of us, when, when, we have, when we have somebody act that way, we don't, we don't tend to embrace the rejection, but Jesus, in his full humanity, embraces the rejection of him as king. He pulls the rejection into his very soul. And he's happy to take the rejection of humanity for one reason, so that we are accepted by God. We often might think of the world kind of like a pyramid. God at the top. And we might put some holy people up at different levels and in our minds. It's certainly how humanity is trying to organize itself. There might be some standout people who stand between the, the masses at the bottom and God because we can't really approach God, right? We're not good enough. I read a book, uh, or in the process of reading a book by a gentleman by the name Cam Carter who talks about the way that Jesus comes to our world turns everything upside down. And he says this, surprise should be our Easter greeting. That sounds reasonable, right? Surprise, I mean, rose from the dead. But listen to this. Surprise, because we find God not at the top of our pyramid, but at the bottom. We find God stooped down, washing the dirty feet of friends, looking up bare-chested with a towel over his shoulder. This one, Paul says, did not count equality with God, a thing to reach for, to cling to, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, becoming subject even to death, even death on a cross. In other words, the surprise of Easter is not that God is risen from the dead, Surprise of Easter is that God accepts humiliation. He accepts servanthood. He accepts being at the bottom of the pyramid. God came to us in the form of Jesus to fully take on all suffering so that we might have a relationship with God. And in this story, we're going to find two sinners. Jesus in the company of two people, one on either side. You may remember a little earlier in the story. Jesus on trial. And the Romans have this tradition where they release somebody at the Passover, some form of mercy. I don't know how releasing a murderer is really mercy, but anyways, they do that. And there's a whole ton of people there, whole crowd of people clamoring that this gentleman, Barabbas, be released. Well, Jesus hangs there with two other people. There's two other people on Where were these guys' the supporters? Why didn't these guys have anybody standing before Pilate saying, no, release our friend. Release the guy we work with. Release our relative. Apparently, these guys had nobody. Jesus in the company of these two who have been completely rejected by humanity, just like he has. Mark skips a detail. Luke picks it up. It's a choice. They both join in the mockery of Jesus, but as they're watching, one of them obviously has some knowledge previously of who this man is. And one of them makes a choice and calls out, why are we mocking him? And he looks over at Jesus and asks him to bring him into his kingdom. They're both on death's door, yet he knows. Somehow, how is it this is the one guy who gets his kingdom as spiritual? 
You almost have to be rejected to understand Jesus' rejection. He's the one who gets it. You got through tough time? Do you know what? Sometimes we don't always, we may look around and wonder, hey, God, everything's going wrong. Where are you in all this? But we open ourselves up to Jesus and we do look at him. It's in those moments where it is toughest that we can find him the best and understand who he is. The yes, it, it, it's his kingdom. Remember me in your kingdom. Some look and see no value in this suffering man on the cross. And they miss the point. What is the good of a king who does not demand majesty? But instead is willing to sacrifice and takes the cross, or takes the thief on a cross beside him to look over and get it. I'm going to be dead soon. Can I be in your kingdom? Oh, but as much as that's happening, there is still the mocker standing around. Eh, he's going to destroy the temple, and then he's going to rebuild it, and there he is up on a cross. So, uh, you, you, you certainly did get a hammer there, Jesus. Not the way you so kind of meant it, you're not rebuilding nothing. Huh. You're really of God, you save people. Why don't you come down off that cross? Prove yourself. Come down. The cross, sometimes we have images. If you watch some films or you look at pictures of the cross being like 10 feet up in the air or something like that, that's probably not how it was. They wouldn't have wasted a lot of wood on criminals. Jesus probably at best a couple of inches higher off the ground. In other words, if you've got somebody who's a little bit taller, they may have been a face level. They're able to get right in his face and mock him. It's not like they're from a great distance. They're right in his face, laughing at him. They got it right, though. He's allowing the temple to be destroyed because he is the temple of God. He's allowing it to be destroyed. He will recreate it. He will rebuild it. But they don't have a right. My family first started going to church when I was a kid. I remember being in a Sunday school class where we talked about this passage. One of the first times I went, one of the kids said, Well, how come he didn't just come off the cross, show himself, and then get back up? I remember thinking, hey, that would have been a great idea. Why didn't he do that? William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, said this. We believe because he did not come down. Why not? He needed to be despised and rejected. He was not out to prove a point. He was out to suffer. Jesus came as love. And you know what? If he had come down on the cross just to prove a point, just to kind of show off a little, you know, his love would have had a limit. Sometimes we have limits to love. If we have to prove ourselves to somebody, that's a limit. Well... Yeah, I love you, but uh, you're wrong, and I'm going to show you. It's not really love, is it? Jesus, does, Jesus isn't to show off. He's not to prove himself. That's not his goal. His love has no limit. There would have been a limit if Jesus had gotten off to prove himself. One author I read this week said, But Jesus went the whole way and died on the cross, and this means that here, or that there, is literally no limit to God's love. That there is nothing in all the universe which that love is not prepared to suffer for humanity. That there is nothing, not even death on a cross, for which the love of Jesus will refuse to bear. 
when we look at the cross, Jesus is saying to us, God loves you like that. With a love that is limitless, a love that will bear every suffering earth has to offer. Why did he not come down? He did not come down because he loves you that much. That's how much he loves you. That he, he was willing to put up with people mocking him right to his face. That he was willing to set aside his own ambitions, his own need to be appreciated. Just to show you that he loves you. His love knows no limits. Sometimes we can call Jesus King, and they're just meaningless words. Fortunately, at different times in the history, the church has acted that way. Certainly, many Christians have acted that way. We can worship Him. We can put up fancy signs like Pilate did, uh, King of the Jews. Really said it didn't really make a difference. When we do that, we treat him like with mockery. But you know, he is the king willing to suffer. Why do we follow because he is more than worthy? Because he has a limitless love. You know, sometimes we can hear this message too often. Sometimes we can sit in church for too long. And that message doesn't penetrate our heart the way it should. We need to continually come back to the cross, to come to this place of suffering, and to recognize again, it is because he loved me. And because he loved me, I follow him as king. And I recognize that he is king and I treat him like that in every aspect of my life. That's going to lead us to our concluding hymn. There is only one way to really follow Jesus. He's either king or he isn't. And if he's king, we trust him. We obey him. I want to follow along in the hymn books. It's hymn number 546.